So the final exam review is going to include the urinary, uh, we'll, uh, which was requested. We'll skip over the endocrine a bit unless you have questions, and then we'll do the reproductive, particularly focusing on the female reproductive cycle. So just to give you a general um, logistic. So the final exam, the lecture, is 100 questions. Half of those will be on the old material. And just like someone said, the old material is chapters, you know, from the very beginning up to digestive. So it's a lot of chapters with 50 questions. So what does that mean? Only a few questions for each one. Perfect. There's only about two to three questions on each chapter. So if I were a student taking this exam right now, I would be really strategic and focus on these last four chapters because they make up 50 questions where all of the other chapters combined make up 50 questions. That does mean, um, I'll give you a little hint, is that the two to three questions I have, I generally focus on general concepts, big concepts, because I already, quizzed you or test you on the more specific detailed portions of the, each of those chapters. Does that make sense? Yes. Questions? Is with the last, or I guess with the first 50 questions, are all those just multiple choice or are those also fill in the blink as well? They are all multiple choice. Okay. All of the 50 questions on the old stuff is multiple choice. Yep, that's a great question. And they are grouped by chapter too. So the first two to three questions will be chapter one. Next two to three questions is chapter two. I mean, in the past we had them all mixed up and I just don't think that that helps students. That just increases anxiety. So I, I lumped them together by chapter. Okay, so hopefully that helps a little bit as well. But that's a good point. These are all multiple choice. The last 50 questions is going to be on the new materials. So think of it as like a fourth exam, like your exam one, two, three, and four, or two, three. So with here, 40 of these are multiple choice, and 10 at the end are fill-in. Questions on the lecture exam? Do you have any tips for the fill and the blank questions? Because those are the ones that I usually struggle with. Yeah, what I actually recommend is to look at them. See, it's it's kind of, so if you were in class with me, I would tell you to look at those 10 questions first because sometimes when you answer the first 40, it helps trigger some memory and you know help you fill out those fill in the blank. But because this is an online exam, it's kind of trickier because you know you have technical issues that can appear when you skip back and forth often. But I think it should be okay if you go straight to the 10 and then go back and do the 50 without skipping back and forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So I would view the last 10 so I can see what the question. So here's what I would do, depending on what kind of you know test taker you are. Um, if you standard wise, um, I would do the first 50 because those are on the old material. So I wanna get those out of the way first. And then I would go to the last 10 to see what the questions are and then go back to question 50 and then just do those multiple choice questions. You know, cause I've already seen the, the fill in the blank and see if anything triggers my memory or some terms that come up, you know, that could potentially be the answer. And then okay. do the 50, continue it in order. That's what I would do. Um, but if you like to do the new material first, then you go, then you know, you would do the 50 of the starting question number 50 and then doing it down. Does that make sense? But try not to skip around too much and just do them like in sequential order, depending on what you think is best for you, whether you want to do the new material first or the old material first. Okay. Other questions? Will we be getting our um quiz results back either today or tomorrow Absolutely. to help review okay yep for sure 
others. Okay, then for a lab, and if you do think of anything, you can always go back and ask me. So for a lab, it is 50 questions. And they are all fill in the blank. And of course, as always, spelling counts. And of those 25, about, it can't be exact, but about 25 um, will be on the old materials. And about 25 will be on the new materials. And here's the thing, you'll find though that as you go back, it's not so much as studying it all over from scratch because you'll find that you'll, you'll be able to do it much easier. And here's, here's my hint for you. Go back to your old quizzes, your lab quizzes, go back to them, you know, use those to review, which ones did you get wrong, you know, figure out why. And then because all those images, you know, are the same. Questions. I was just wondering, it's not so much about the test. I was just wondering um, if anyone has any, the skeletal system, what's really hard for me is all of the little bones in the wrist area. I like, I know the names, but I can never remember where they are exactly. I was just wondering if anyone had any like tips or tricks to remember all of those little bones. When I studied it, I pointed out the bones on like my own hand or my own foot. Okay. You can actually draw them on there. I had a student who actually drew the bones on her hand. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, like you can't do that for the exam, but while you're studying. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. And then if you watch the video, I made a separate video for the skeletal lab. With that one, I don't think I did. So I'll go back and watch that one. Yeah. And I gave mnemonic, helpful mnemonics to remember like okay. some lovers try physicians that they can't handle. That gives okay. you the, the bones in the correct order and so on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so go back and look at that video. Yeah, some lovers, <laughs> that's right. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. A little raunchy, but better than the one that your book gives. <laughs> like Mandy's on, you know, Max and Mandy, you know, which one's on top of, well, anyways. But um, yeah, so yeah. Any other questions? All right, so hopefully you feel a little bit more comfortable about it. We try to do it in a way that, you know, reduces anxiety as much as we can in terms of like the format of the exams. So st standard, just like any other exam that you take, it is um, somewhat, of, you know, we have to use the respondents lockdown. And please, please, please make sure that you do um, that the webcam and the volume is working, so it records um, both audio and visual. And make sure that you do a really thorough environmental scan. Because if respondents flags you, I have to watch, you know, everything unless you have a really thorough environment. If you have a really thorough environmental scan, clearly nothing on your right, nothing on your left, behind you, in front of you, kind of just everywhere around you. I don't ever watch your video, even if it flags it, because I'm like, oh, nope, the environmental scan, you know, protected them, show me that there was nothing around them. So I don't really care to watch the, your actual video. Okay. So please, please make sure you do a proper environmental scan. I can't stress that enough. If I don't have the environmental scan and it flags you, I have to report you to my program director. And I really don't want to have to do that. And then a whole bunch of people watch your videos. Okay. So please, please, please do a proper environmental scan. The, the environmental scan, do you have mm -hmm. to do a, a 360 of the room? Or you, you just... Uh, yeah, it, it's actually recommended to do a 360 of the room just to make sure that there's nothing posted, you know, beyond your computer. Some people even have a long mirror behind them so that when the cam, you know, records, it's recording them, you know, to show... It's pretty much to protect you to show that you're not cheating. If the respondents lockdown flags you. Otherwise, I don't ever watch any of these videos because I'm like, no, there's no reason to. 
Okay, so um, it, it is recommended to do a 360. And if that's not possible, um, or just to kind of make sure that there's no, you know, no doubt of any academic disintegrity, put like a long mirror behind you. I think I emailed um, one of a, a demo of how to do an environmental scan. So if you are ever in doubt, watch that video. Okay. All right. Any questions before I go right into the urinary and repro? Um, we can still use a sheet of paper for like spelling uh, out still. We just show that piece of paper in the environmental scan. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Yep. And yeah. Yep. Okay. So let's go right into it. So we have urinary, endocrine, and reproductive. Oops, sorry. So for the urinary system, make sure you can listen, describe the functions of the kidneys, and they include filtering blood. And filtering blood includes both cleaning and removing the waste, okay? So the analogy that I like to give of what the kidney does is that the kidney is like your clothes washer. You throw your dirty clothes into the washer, it washes it, and it only removes the dirt and not your actual shirt, right? So that's what your kidneys does, is that it filters, it, clean, it, it washes your blood and removes only the things that it doesn't need or is dirty, but leaves the good stuff in there so that it can go back into your body, okay? So think of the, a, a clothes washer or, you know, dishwasher. It removes the, the dirt, but keeps the actual dish, okay? Um, so that's what your kidneys does. In addition to that, it also regulates water volumes makes sense, right? Because if your kidneys are releasing, um, removing more water, then of course the water volume in your body overall decreases. If it retains it, your body volume overall increases. And if you keep the water in your body, it's going to affect the, the pH, okay? Because in addition to water, your kidneys also regulate how much hydrogen stays in your body and how much hydrogen is removed through urine, as well as a lot of other chemicals. So not only does it regulate water volume, it regulates pH, it regulates various um, chemical balance as well. Okay, questions on that? Okay, then you wanna be able to describe the gross anatomy of a kidney and just remind me what's gross anatomy again? Structure. Yep, keep going, structure that. Um, structure. That you can see with your regular eyes. That's right, yep. So gross anatomy is things that you can see with your eyes, with your unaided eye. So actually, I, if you if we were in class, I would cut a, a, a pig, kidney in half, and I would show you all the structures that you can see, which includes the fibrous capsule, the hilum, which is not an actual structure, it's just like a, an area, um, the blood vessels, the renal cortex, medulla, and the renal pelvis. So all of that, all of these things you can see with your unaided eye. And then we would learn about the microscopic anatomy of the kidney, which then would be things you cannot see in your eye, with your unaided eye, and that includes the nephron, okay? So the nephron includes all these structures, the renal corpuscle, which is an area that is consistent of the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule, but technically which one is part of the nephron? So is the glomerulus or glomerular capsule part of the nephron? Glomerulus, I can't say that word. <laughs> What is the glomerulus? Uh, the inside of it, and then the capsule's the outside. Mm, that's their location, that is correct. Um, anyone else, what's the glomerulus? Or what, let's expand on that. What's the glomerulus? A network of capillaries. There you go. So the glomerulus is a network of capillaries, and you're right, it's on the inside, but as the network of capillaries, it is not a part of the nephron. So it's actually the glomerular capsule that's part of the nephron, okay? 
then connected to the glomerular capsule, you would then have the renal tubules, starting from the PCT to the nephron loop to the DCT. And then depending on which book you look at, some consider the collecting duct as part of the nephron, others do not, okay? In the description, make sure you know the structure, function, and tissue lining. And again, I'm making you know the tissue lining. Why do you think that might be? Why did you have to know the tissue lining in respiratory, digestive? It wasn't to torture you with different things. What is it? I'm sorry. Uh, because they can handle and do different things. That's exactly it. Okay. So it shouldn't be a memorization, but more, of, oh, that makes sense why it's lined the way it is. Okay. And then make sure you can describe the process of your information. That's what we'll go through because that was requested. Describe the ureter, urinary bladder, urethra. Make sure you include the function and the layers. And then describe the process of micturation, which is also what we will be going through. Okay. All right. Um, any questions before we go right into it? And remember, um, you can stay unmuted or you can put into the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. Okay. Um, just kind of basic overview. What's number one? The left adrenal gland. Very good. Two? The left kidney. Three. Left ureter. Left ureter. I love that you're using your right and left because that's what you need to include on the lab. Okay. So if there's a pair of them, always put right or left. But if there's not, it's, if it's just one, then you do not need to put right or left. Okay. Number four. The urinary bladder. Number five. Um. The urethra. Yep. Number eight. Uh, right venal vein. Nine. Nine. Yep. Nine. Right renal artery. Excellent. Okay. Now, I don't remember if we made you know six and seven, the abdominal aorta. Did you have to know that? No. Okay, now we will skip it. All right, so in order to understand your information, <clears throat> we need to first go through, um, understand what the nephron looks like, okay? So there are the following parts of the nephron. So we're just gonna write in here, one. So what is this first part right here? We're, we're just gonna go through the nephron for now. So what's number one? What is this? Renal corpuscle? Uh, it is the renal corpuscle. Both of you are right. It is the renal corpuscle and it does include the glomerulus. But if we're looking at just the nephron and you know, it's really tricky because they're both together. But if we're just identifying the nephron, what would number one be? The glomerular capsule. Excellent. Glomerular capsule. Okay. Now all of this is considered the renal tubules. Which is going to do part by part. So um this right here is number two. And what's number two? The proximal convoluted tubule. Perfect. And this whole area is number three. And what's number three? Nephron loop. Excellent. 
And of course, you have to know the A and the B. What's 3A and what's 3B? Descending and then uh, ascending. Yep. And I want you to say the full name because that's what you need to put onto the, the lab exam. Descending limb of nephron loop. Excellent. And 3B? Ascending limb of nephron loop. Perfect. And then all of this is four. And what's four? Distal convoluted tubule. Very good. And five. The collecting duck. Very good. So those are the parts of the nephron glomerular capsule to the PCT, to the nephron loop, both the descending and ascending, and then the DCT and then the collecting duct. Okay, so let's go through the glomerular capsule a little bit more. What do we know about the glomerular capsule? It's a series of collection cells that wrap around the glomerulus. Okay. And they and, hold. Yep, go ahead. Sorry. Um, they're able to keep out um, what leaks from the cap. Is it the capillaries? Mm -hmm. Yep, because that's the glomerulus. It's a network of capillaries. Excellent. So that's great. So you, you had mentioned that they were layers of cells, right? So you have an inside, you have this first one right here, and then you have this one out here, okay? So the cells that line right here, they're really weird looking cells. What's special about these cells? they have a particular name. Do you know what, what it is? So the glomerular capsule consists of what type of cells? It's an epithelium, that's a tissue though. So we know it's an epithelium, but that's the tissue. The epithelium, the tissue is made up of cells. What are those cells called? Is it fenestrated? So the glomerulus is, has, an, has a fenestrated endothelium. So we'll get to that when we get to the blood vessel. But for now, we're going to focus on the glomerular capsule. So what, do these, what are these cells called? I'll, I'll give you a clue. They look like feet. They look like feet. And there's a term that you should know because that describes the cells of the glomerular capsule. Podocytes? Very good, podocytes. Podocytes, whatever, as long as you know what it is. So, <laughs> podocytes. Okay, so the glomerular capsule is made up of what type of tissue? Simple cuboidal epithelial. Okay, so yep, and that tissue is made up of what type of cell? You you Can answered you earlier. The Sure. So we're just kind of going through the structure of the glomerular capsule. So like you said, the glomerular capsule is made up of simple cuboidal epithelium. That's the tissue. And we know that tissues are made up of cells, right? So what cells make up the simple cuboidal epithelium of the glomerular capsule? The podocytes. There you go. Exactly. Okay. All right. 
Now, the podocytes, it, you're going to find later on when we talk about the filtration membrane, plays a role in the filtration membrane in making sure that only certain things go through. Okay, good. Then, so that we talked about the lining essentially and the cells that form that lining. Okay, then let's move to the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. What lining would you find in the PCT? Is it cuboidal? Is it ciliated pseudostratified? Oh, careful. Pseudostratified is only found where? Um, respiratory system? Yes, that's right. So, so what should this, yep, go ahead. Is it um, ciliated columnar? It's not necessarily ciliated, but we say that it, it has a similar structure to cilia, but on a smaller scale. I don't know. Is it, okay, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Simple cuboidal epithelial? Yep. Or PCT, right? Yep. Okay. So it is simple cuboidal epithelium, okay? These, what are the cells that make up the simple cuboidal epithelium at the PCT called? The microvilli? That's not a cell, but that's, that's a good thing to, rem to remember though. You will find absorbative cells. with microvilli. Okay, so the absorbative cells have microvilli and whenever you hear microvilli, you should asso associate that with absorption. Do you remember where we learned about microvilli earlier? As well as absorbative yes. cells? Cell surface extensions. Exactly, in the digestive system. Okay, because they increase absorption. Okay, so the absorbative cells are also here, which makes sense because the PCT, what is the PCT known for? The area of what? Tubular reabsorption. Yes, and not only, I mean, they all absorb to some extent, but the PCT has the main tubular, the majority of the absorption occurs in the PCT. Do you remember studying that? Like 60 to, yes, like 60 to 70 percent of the absorption occurs here. In the PCT. Okay. And what is being absorbed in the PCT? Things that shouldn't have been leaked. Mm, no. And we have, that's a really good point. And we'll come back to that as to what things should move from the glomerulus to the glomerular capsule and which shouldn't. And actually, let's just do that now. Okay. So here you can see the glomerulus right here. Oops. Here you can see the glomerular capsule. I'm sorry, the glomerulus. Okay. This is the next thing that we'll talk about is the actual process of your information, which includes glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion, and your book also mentions water um, retention. Okay. But you can see that between the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule, it forms what's called the filtration membrane that allows certain things to move through and other things not. So essentially everything moves from blood into the nephron except for large things like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, okay? And that's why you should never find blood in your urine because blood should not, red blood cells should not be able to cross that filtration membrane. But, in a, but everything else in blood 
will crop. So it's not so much as leaking, but you want those things to move, everything in plasma to move from the glomerulus to the glomerular capsule, okay? So actually quite a bit is filtered. And later on, we'll talk about glomerular filtration rate. So you filter, depending on whether you're male or female, anywhere from 100 to 150 liters a day, okay? You don't urinate that much. You only urinate about one to two liters a day, okay? Now, so I wouldn't use the term leaking because I mean, like a lot of plasma moved into the kidney to be cleaned, okay? And then the stuff that is removed then is the stuff that your body no longer needs or it has excessive amounts of like, if you drink five gallons of water, you have too much water, more than your body can handle, it will, it will move from your glomerulus to the glomerular capsule, to the PCT, DC, the nephron loop, the DCT, and then the collecting duct, and then to the, you know, all the way down to your urinary bladder and then out. Does that make sense? So what is actually filtered includes water, salts, um, nutrients, waste, okay, like glucose, uric acid, urea, amino acids, salts. So pretty much anything that's moved by blood, except for the larger substances like red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets actually get filtered, okay? And so that's what moves from the glomerulus into the glomerular capsule. So then when it moves, continues onto the PCT, that's where it's starting to go, okay, I need to put back the stuff that I need. And that's why the PCT is lined with simple cuboidal epithelium with absorptive cells that have the microvilli because that will allow for the fastest um, reabsorption to occur. Okay. So the majority of stuff that moves through your plasma, that is in your plasma, plasma that's moved from the glomerulus to the glomerular capsule is actually put back into your blood vessels at the PCT, okay? The remaining stuff continues onward to the nephron loop. Now the nephron loop has the descending and ascending, and then within the ascending and descending, you can see that there's a difference in, in the shape, right? You can see that there's a thick segment and a thin segment, okay? So in the nephron loop, within the ascending and descending, so the ascend, the descending has this portion that's thick, this portion that's thin, the ascending has this portion that's thin, and this portion that's thick, okay? So within the nephron loop in general, there are two segments. There's the thin segment, and then there's the thick segment of the nephron loop. So clearly, they're gonna be lined with different things. Let's start with the thick. The thick segments of the nephron loop is gonna be lined with what? Simple cuboidal. Yep, simple cuboidal epithelium. And what kind of cells? Also the absorptive cells with microvilli. Okay. So at the nephron loop, whatever is remaining, okay, um, smaller substances are going to be reabsorbed because it, it's lined with the absorptive cells with microvilli. So still decent amount of reabsorption occurring, okay? Now, when you move to the thin segment, what is that lined with? Simple squamous. Yeah. Okay, so simple squamous epithelium. Okay. Now the simple squamous epithelium is the thin, it's just a regular, you know, thin endothelial-like cell, okay? 
And at this point, that makes sense because at this point, what's being absorbed, reabsorbed is mostly water and salt, smaller substances. So you don't need that full like absorption ability that you find in the absorptive cells in the microvilli. Okay. So here, along the, the loop of nephron right here or the nephron loop, okay, along here you'll find reabsorption of mostly salts and water. Okay. And that's why it's just simple epithelium. By the time you get to the DCT, what is it going to be lined with at this point? It's thicker, so it's still simple cuboidal epithelium. It has the absorptive cells, but at this point, is there any microvilli? No. That's right. So very little gets reabsorbed here. Okay. And that's why knowing the lining helps to know the function. Okay. Now let's go back one more time. So the glomerular capsule reabsorption is not happening there because that's where filtration happens. Things are moving from the blood into the nephron. Okay, so we'll just leave it at that for now. Two, three, and four. And to some extent, five is where reabsorption, tubular reabsorption occurs. And of those, where does the majority of tubular reabsorption occur? PCT. The PCT. That's right. Why? It has microvilli. That's right. It's lined with simple cuboidal epithelium, specifically with absorptive cells that have microvilli. And that's where the majority of your fluid is reabsorbed. Because if you don't reabsorb the fluid that you filter, you would die. You'd be in the bathroom 24 hours. Because remember, we filter anywhere from 150 to 180 liters a day. Okay, you would die. Okay, so we have to have this filtration process or this absorption process to bring the fluid back, the clean fluid, back into our bloodstream and into our bodies, okay? And that's why luckily because of the kidney, we only urinate one to two liters a day. And that's why the kidney is so important. If you have kidney failure, you can live for about one to three days, at which point you will die because there's too much fluid staying in your body. There's too much toxins that are staying in your body. And that's why you have to go on what? Dialysis. That's right. Dialysis is a machine that it's like an artificial kidney, external kidney. It takes all the blood out. Of course, it's going to do it slowly, not all of your blood at the same time. You know, it's going to flow the blood into this machine and the machine is going to separate the toxic stuff and the waste from your blood. At this point, it's called filter. Uh, uh, fil yeah, filter. Um, filtrate. And it's going to then pump it back into your kidneys and then to be filled, you know, to be reabsorbed and so on. Okay. So your actually it doesn't go back to your kidneys, sorry. It it directly connects to your blood vessels and then it acts as your kidney. So it doesn't go back into your kidney. But it, essentially what it does is that it cleans your blood in the way that your kidneys does. Okay. So that's why, that's why the kidney is so important. It's going to take the majority of the plasma in your blood. And you know that plasma makes up the majority of blood, right? It's like 55%. Do you remember studying that in, back in the cardiovascular? So then take the majority of blood, the plasma component mostly, okay? And it's going to clean it and then put it back into your bloodstream, okay? So this reabsorption, tubular reabsorption is extremely important. Okay, all right, so let's go back and add another layer. But before I do that, is there any questions? Okay, so let's go back and now, Whenever you have things moving, 
what do you have to pay attention to? What ha always has to play a role in here when you have a movement of substances? Um, ATP. That's right. You have to figure out how it's being moved. Okay. So let's start with the PCT. So in the PCT, what mechanism of movement do you think is going to happen, active or passive? Um, active. That's right. And if it's active, it's going to have lots of mitochondria and it's going to require lots of ATP. Right. So here you would expect to see mito lots of mitochondria. Oops, mitochondria. And ATP. So you know that this is an active process. Active transport. Okay. When you get to the thick segments, it's going to be active or passive? Active. Mm-hmm. So you also find mitochondria, ATP there as well. How about the thin segment? Now you're talking about the movement of water and salts. Passive. Yes. And passive has a few, right? Passive has diffusion, it has osmosis, it has filtration. <coughs> Excuse me. What's happening here? I'm going to guess and say osmosis. Yes. Yes. Never be afraid to be wrong. This is the best time to be right or wrong. Okay. Because this is where we're, it's completely cool to be. Okay. But you're absolutely right. It's osmosis. Okay. The water is moving through osmosis. So that's why it is passive. And there's another mechanism that we really didn't talk about. And that's kind of like a, we call it a hitchhiking. So what happens is you also have diffusion happening here. And what's happening is that the salts move. And when the salts move, the other salts that have high affinity to the, the salt that is re, reabsorbed moves along as well. It's kind of like a hitchhike. Okay. So when sodium moves, what follows? What binds to sodium? Water. Not water, but water will follow this compound. Calcium? Not calcium. Keep going. It, it, you're closer though. It does start with a C. Give you a clue. It has something to do with electrolytes. Carbohydrate? Chloride. Chloride. Yes. Chlorine. Chloride. That's exactly it. So when sodium is absor reabsorbed, chlorine chloride follows it. Okay. So it's passive at the thin segment of the nephron loop. The mechanism of transport is passive. Water is going to move from where it's high to low. And that's because it follows the diffusion of sodium, which pulls chloride with it. Isn't that cool? So that's how you reabsorb your water and your salts in this area. Okay. Then when you move to the DCT, okay, not much is happening there. Okay. So in the DCT, even though not much is being reabsorbed at this point, because everything has been mostly reabsorbed by PCT and the nephron loop, there is still some reabsorption that does occur there though, okay? And it's gonna have to pull it because it's the larger stuff, not the water, well, some water in some cells, but some like remaining larger um, compounds. So at this point, it is still active. It goes back to being active. Okay. Questions? Yeah. 
there's a really nice picture in your textbook and I will make sure to remember, I'll write a note to myself, send textbook picture that shows you exactly what's moving where. Okay, if you happen to know it, let me know. But if not, I'll look it up. I'll, I'll look it up after our meeting, okay? But that's to give you kind of an intro to the nephron. So, so far we've only talked about the nephron. We've talked about the lining. We've talked about the mechanism of transport to help you easier understand the process of your information. Questions? Oh, here, huh. okay, it's figure 23, I must have added already. So figure 23.22, and you can see, this is, I love this picture, because the blue shows you the reabsorption, and that's what we've been talking about, okay? So you can see that the majority of the substances in plasma is reabsorbed at the PCT. Water and some salts are absorbed at the um, nephron loop. Okay. And then at, by the time you get to the DCT, very few, a lot less things that are being reabsorbed by the DCT. And by the time it gets to the collecting duct, not much at all, very little water and very little urea can be reabsorbed. Okay, so we're just looking at the blue ones right now because the blue is the reabsorption. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's do that again. Yeah, let's let's do that again. But this time we're going to look at blood vessels. Okay. So the first time we did it, we did the nephron itself. The second time we're going to do it, we're going to look at the blood vessels. So you can see that the blood vessel starts off from what I require you to know as we'll do A. Oops. A has the renal artery. So the renal artery is going to take the blood into the kidney. And then it goes through a series of changes. It just, you know, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. I don't require you to know the transition of the blood vessels names at that point until it becomes the afferent arterial. Okay. I what helps me to remember this is that A has an arriving. E as an exiting. Okay, so the blood vessel starts off as the renal artery, becomes the afferent arterial. What's the difference between an artery and arterial again? Arterial is smaller. Yeah, yep. And then from the arterial, it becomes the glomerulus. And essentially, the glomerulus is what again? Define that for me. Network of capillaries. Perfect. So essentially, it becomes a capillary. Now, here's where it's strange. Go all the way back, flip back to when we talked about the cardiovascular system, specifically, go to where we talk about blood vessels. Normally, what's the transition of blood vessels? It starts, it leaves the heart as. And artery becomes becomes a arterial. So yep, so arteries to arterials, but then it becomes what? What's the next major blood vessel? It becomes capillary. Yes. And then from capillaries it becomes what? Venules. They exactly so venules are smaller versions of veins, right? So it usually goes from artery to capillary to vein, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, here is one of the exceptions in your body. You have two exceptions to where it goes from artery to capillary to vein, and this is one of them. Because notice here it goes from our artery, whether it's the renal artery or the afferent arterial, they're forms of arteries. 
and then it becomes the capillary. That's the glomerulus. And then it becomes what again? Capillary? Nope. An arterial? Yeah, it becomes a type of artery, right? So from artery to capillary to artery, which is like, wait a minute, isn't it supposed to go from artery to capillary to vein? And that's true 90% of the time, except for this. This is the one exception where it goes from artery to capillary back to a form of an artery, which is an arterial, okay? And then it goes to become um, A, B, C, D, E. It goes back to being a capillary. And then from the capillary, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. It goes back to being a vein or it becomes a vein. Okay, so let's go through that again. So the blood vessels that move through your kidney starts off as the renal artery, becomes the afferent arterial, then the glomerulus, goes back to being an artery called the efferent arterial, and then becomes the paratubular capillary, and then the venule, and then leaves, let's see that, G, oops, G, leaves the kidney as the renal vein. Okay. You will want to know this flow. Okay. Now notice there's a difference, and that's why I did it separately. Initially, we went through the, the structure of a nephron. So on a test, and this is one of the test questions, if I ask you to identify the, the structures in order of a nephron, you would say one, glomerular capsule, two, PCT, three, nephron loop, four, DCT, five, CD, collecting duct. On the other hand, if I'm asking you about the, the flow of the, of the blood, you would say renal artery to afferent arterial to glomerulus to the afferent arterial to the paratubular capillary to the venule, then to the renal vein. Make sense? Questions? give you a few seconds to sink that in and then ask questions if you have them. Is this okay? Is this confusing? This is the time to ask. Okay, so let me ask you a question then. Why do you have to have capillaries that wrap around the renal tubules? It allows the blood to interact with the filtrate? Mm, slightly, not, not in that way though. Think what's happening at the renal tubules, and we talked a little. We talked about that in this slide right here for reabsorption. There you go. So, what's how would you define reabsorption? It's a movement of substances from where to where. It's the ability of blood to take back materials it needs from the filtrate. Yeah. Okay. So it's the movement of the filtrate when it's in the glomer the glomerular, I'm sorry, when it's in the nephron, the renal tubules, to go back into the blood vessel. Okay. And can things move back into arteries?
No. Right. No. Why? Correct. Why? Because they move things away. Nope. That's still within the artery, though. So why can't things move like this from here? Oops. From here into here. You're close though, you're, you're right about function. So why is it that things can only move into capillaries? I believe it's because the capillaries don't have all of the layers. You are correct, excellent. That's not its function. The function of capillaries is for diffusion, right? It's for the movement of things. So because arteries and veins have those three layers, it's very difficult for things to move through those three layers. And that's why capillaries allow for diffusion because they're intentionally what? This is pulling back all the way from the previous chapters. They're thin, right? They only have the endothelium and the basement membrane. Remember that? Okay, so here's the thing. Regardless of whether you know it or not, you can still make educated guess. So if I were to ask you what wraps around the renal tubules and allows for reabsorption, automatically you can rule out arteries and you can rule out veins, which leaves you with what? Capillaries. That's right. And that's why it has to transition from artery to capillary to artery back to being capillaries and then to veins. The artery brings the blood into the kidney. The glomerulus, that network of capillary, allows for filtration, the movement of blood from the capillary into the glomerular capsule or from the glomerulus into the glomerular capsule. And then the capillaries that wrap themselves around the renal tubules allow for reabsorption allow for movement of substance from the, the nephron into the blood vessel again. And then it becomes a vein because then it has to leave the kidney and go back to the heart. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense as to why it's the renal artery or where, why it's an artery, why it's a capillary, why it's a vein when it is. Instead of having to memorize, okay, you know, artery, our afferent arterial, glomerulus, it should make sense. Okay, questions? Okay, I think we're ready to go into your question now, filtration, oh, sorry, the your information. All right, so your information starts with this. Nope. I keep wanting to write on my big screen, A. Glomerular filtration, okay? Glomerular filtration occurs where? Glomerular filtration occurs where? Across the filtration membrane. Okay, where's the filtration membrane? In the glomerulus. And? And the PCT? Nope. The glomerular capsule? Beautiful, that's it. So that's why we call this area right here. Let's not do it in red, let's do it in, uh, let's do it in orange. What do we call this area right here, where it's a combination of glomerulus and glomerular capsule? We had a name for it. Is it the renal corpuscle? Corpus it is, exactly. So glomerular filtration occurs at the renal corpuscle. Which includes the glomerulus, Glomerulus, 
sure it's not right, and glomerular capsule. Okay. And someone mentioned the filtration membrane. That's beautiful. Filtration membrane. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay. So do you remember how I told you that the this layer right here of the glomerular capsule, what is it made up of? Podocytes? Yes, exactly. So we got we, we took care of one of the filtration membrane. Now we have to take care of the other two. Okay. So to do that, I had to zoom in and, and get you this image right here. So you can see that this image is zoomed in from this right here between the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. That's what forms the filtration membrane. So look how beautiful this is, like literally. Okay, so all this tan right here is the podocyte of the visceral layer of the glomerular capsule. This is an old term. We're not gonna concern ourselves with the Bowman's capsule, okay? So it's the podocyte of the visceral layer of the glomerular capsule. And, and not, do you see why it's called the podocyte? It looks like a feet. You know, it has like the, to like the extensions. It has the body of the cell. So it looks really cool. And, it, and its extensions, its dendrites wrap around the blood vessel and forms what's called the filtration slits. Okay, so that's one layer that kind of makes sure that only certain things specifically the plasma, moves from the bloodstream into the nephron. The other layer that makes sure that only certain things should move through is of the capillary itself. So we know that capillaries have endothelial layer, right? Okay. And it also has a basement membrane. Basal lamina is like the basement membrane. Okay, now the capillary of the glomerulus is specialized, okay? We call it fenestrated glomerular endothelial cells. The term fenestrated, if any of you have taken um, German, means window. So fenestrated means window. So you see how the endothelium of this capillary right here has these windows? Yeah? Okay. So those small windows or small openings allow for the plasma to move through, but not the red blood cells and not the white blood cells and not the platelets. Okay, so that's in a healthy adult or healthy person, okay? What can happen is that the kidney can become inflamed and these filtration slits open wider and these windows open wider, allowing for blood cells, red blood cells, to actually move through and find its way into your bloodstream. And that's oftentimes when you see red blood cells in your, in your urine, it's a sign of infection, okay? Or some damage that your kidney has undergone, okay? Otherwise, you should not find blood in your urine at all. So let's go back to the filtration membrane. The filtration membrane has three layers, okay? One, the fenestrated endothelium of the capillary. Two, the basement membrane, the basal lamina. Three, the, the podocytes of the glomerular capsule that form the filtration slits, okay? So if I ask you in a test, what are the three layers of the filtration membrane? What would you say? And I'm gonna get out of there. So it's not as easy just to read it. The fenestration, basal lim Careful, lim fenestrations of what? Of the glom of the glom glom I can't say that <laughs> endothelial cell. 
no. Not glomerular, but glomerulus. Uh, yep. Yep, yep. Okay, keep going. The basal lamina? Yeah. The basement membrane? Yep. And then the slits, the slit membrane? The slits are formed by what? Podocytes. Yep. And podocytes belong to what? The capsule? Yes. Yep. And it's really hard to pronounce, but I just remember glow. Like, you know, if something's glowing, so glomerular, it helps. And then glomerulus. Okay. So just think things that, that are glowing. Okay. All right. So the glomerular filtration, we know where it occurs. It occurs at the renal corpuscle between the glomerulus and glomerular capsule. You have the filtration membrane, which one of your members, you know, classmates beautifully listed the three. The um, endothelium of the capillary. Oh my God, my cats are fighting. Hold on. Sorry about that. Okay. So the, glomer the glomerulus, the, um, the, Fenestrated endothelium of the capillary of the glomerulus, the basement membrane, and then the podocytes of the glomerular capsule. So those are your filtration membrane. Okay. All right. And then in addition to that, you should know what substance moves. Okay. And there's a whole list of them here. I'm not going to specifically require you to memorize this list, but just know pretty much all the main solutes. Okay. So no, for example, it includes the carbohydrates, the proteins, amino acids, um, and then the urea, which is the waste, and then the nutrients, the vitamins, and then the salts. Okay. Um, let's go back over here. Okay. Solutes. We've got the glucose, amino acids, proteins. You've got the vitamins. You've got waste products. And have salts. Okay. All right. And um, what else should you know about it? Oh, make sure you also understand glomerular filtrate rate. Glomerular filtrate rate. And that's what I talked to you about earlier that your body filters anywhere from 150 to 180 liters a day. But do you urinate that much? No, you only urinate one to two liters per day. Perfect. Okay, good. So make sure you, you know the glomerular filtrate in that one as well. I think that's the major things that you need to know about glomerular filtration. Okay, then tubular reabsorption. Where does it occur? The PCT. Mm -hmm. Yep, and DCT and nephronomy. Yeah, so it's moving from those areas to where? The collecting duct? Nope. So mm. you're thinking, so let me, so you, that would be a, a correct answer if I were asking you about the flow. But I'm asking about tubular reabsorption. So it's a movement, right, from a fluid from those areas that you've listed, the PCT, DCT, and nephron loop. So where are they moving into in tubular reabsorption?
the blood in the capillaries? Yeah. So it's moving from the tubular, oh, sorry, the um, renal tubes. From the renal tubules. And that includes the PCT, nephron loop, DCT, and CD. And it's moving into the paratubular capillaries. Okay. And then the more specifics of them, you know that it's moved through active transport and then some passive water moves flow flows passively. So you know there's active occurring and you should know where as well as passive movements and where. Okay. Now, here's a new one we have not talked about yet and that's tubular secretion, okay? So the, let me give you a scenario, okay? So let's say that your body is, you know, that point, in, that period in time, your body goes, okay, I have this much water. I need this much water in the body. I need to excrete this much water to have a balance in the body. And all of a sudden you drink five gallons of water. Does that mean you carry that five gallons of water until that whole section moves through your blood vessels until it reaches the kidney? Or do you have a way in which you can get rid of them last minute? You have to have a way to get rid of them last minute, right? And that's what tubular secretion is. So rather than going through all that process of filtration, glomerular filtration right here at the renal corpuscle, it can move certain and limited things directly into the renal tubules. So tubular secretion is where you can directly remove things into the renal tubules so that it is urinated out, okay? But only limited things can move through here. So here in tubular secretion, it's going to occur between the paratubular capillaries and it's going back into the renal tubules or it's going into the renal tubules without, it's essentially bypassing the renal corpuscle, okay? But let's look at what can move. You can see that all the stuff is being filtered where in terms of secretion, less can be moved through. So all the pink things are what can be secreted last minute. Okay. So secretion, I think of secretion as like a last attempt at removing things from your bloodstream to be eliminated through urination. But because it's not going through the filtration right here, it's very limited in terms of what can move through. Okay. Questions? Okay. Questions? What doesn't, what still doesn't make sense? Can you go over um, the tubular reabsorption? Yep. Again, just like the, the steps one more time. Sure. So in tubular reabsorption right here. So now that you've removed, that you've moved plasma into the nephron, as it's moving through the nephron, you're gonna wanna take back the stuff that you need in the body, okay? So you can do it in three main areas. You can take most of the things back at the PCT. 
you can take the salt and the water back at the nephron loop and whatever is remaining that are small, you can take back at the DCT. So essentially tubular reabsorption is taking back the fluids from the nephron into the blood vessel. What part of the nephron? The renal tubules. What part of the blood vessel? The paratubular capillaries. Okay. How is it done? It depends. What does it depend on? The lining. Okay. How is it done? Well, at the PCT, it's through active transport. At the nephron loop, it's passive in the thin segments and active in the thick segments. In the DCT, it's through active transport. What's being moved? The majority of stuff, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, salts are being reabsorbed at the PCT. The nephron loop is responsible for the salts in the water. The DCT is the remaining salts. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Love questions. Ask, ask, whatever it doesn't make sense, whatever you, because sometimes when I say it over and over again, I say it in slightly different ways that you know, may make more sense than the first time. What else is, doesn't make sense here? So I have a question. I was listening to the, the extra video that you had uploaded on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know on our notes, it says like, it just really talks about the filtrate in the end. Well, like in step two, it's still filtrate, but not urine. But then I was listening and you said something about it's not actually filtrate, it's plasma. Um, was I misunderstanding that? No, 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 no. That's what I'm going to go through next. So that's okay. perfect. All right. So that's a perfect segue into the fluids. So I've been trying generically talk, to talk about and refer to them as fluids um, because I haven't gotten into what the fluids are called where, depending on where they're located, okay? So that's a great question. Okay. So the fluids that we're talking about go by three names. It's the same fluid mostly, but it goes by three different names, plasma, filtrate, and urine, okay? Anytime that fluid is in the blood vessel, it's called plasma. Anytime that fluid is in the glomerular, I'm sorry, it's in the nephron, it's called filtrate. Anytime that fluid moves to the seed, Collecting duct and onward, that's called urine. Onward. Okay. So here's a previous test question. What was the fluid in the glomerulus? What has it become when it goes into the glomerular capsule? Plasma. So it was plasma and it becomes. Okay. Filtrate. Very good. Let's oh, do yeah, one. okay. Yeah, let's do another one. In tubular secretion, what was the fluid called and what has it become? Filtrate to urine. Let's look at that again. In tubular secretion, what was the fluid, what has it become? Um, does it skip the filtrate part? So it's at the paratubular capillaries. So if it's in the paratubular capillaries, what is it called? Plasma. Plasma. Yeah. And once it gets into the renal tubules, what is it called? Filtrate. Yes. That's the answer. So in tubular secretion, the fluid was called plasma because it was in the paratubular capillaries and it moves into the renal tubules and that's why it's called filtrate. So it goes from plasma to filtrate. Should we do one more? Yeah. In tubular reabsorption, what was the fluid? What has it become? Filtrate. 
filtrate, and now it's plasma. Yes, you got it. Oh, you got it. So there's a question in the chat. Does both reabsorption and secretion occur in all, oh, let me move my chat a little bit. Read it all. Does both reabsorption and secretion occur in all parts of the renal tubules? Yes, it does. Yep, and you can see it in this picture right here. I love this picture right here. It's really nice because it shows you what exactly is being reabsorbed, what exactly is being secreted. So you can see that, yes, both reabsorption and secretion occur along the entire renal tubules. Okay, great question. Other questions? Okay, so that's, that's your information. Now, once you do get urine, ooh, oh wait, that's okay. So, <laughs> so we've already talked about this, right? The external structures. So let's connect it all together because this has been a test question in the past. Okay, so I'm just gonna use the screen right here to talk about it. So we start off with, so we were to follow the flow of your information. And we're going to start from the renal artery. So blood is brought into the kidneys. Where would that blood move to next? And use all the like the the, the steps that we provided. So from so if you were to follow something that's going to eventually become urine, where how would it move? So from the renal artery to where? Uh, afferent arterial. Excellent. Keep going. Uh, glomerulus. Yep. And then the efferent arterial. Mm, careful. We're doing flow of your information. So, so if it went to the aff, if it went to the efferent, it's not going to end up in urine unless it's secreted. But we're we're just going to fo follow the average pathway. So from the glomerulus, it would be filtered into where? The capillaries? No, not P the capillaries. PCT. Not the PCT yet. Glomerulus. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't distinguish the what all of you said. Where does it go to next? Glomerular capsule. Yes, good job. Glomerular capsule. Because this is what happens here, remember? Oop, not that one, this one. See all these green arrows right here? Okay, so it goes into the glomerular capsule and then it moves to where? Now you can say it. Someone said it earlier. PCT. Yeah. <laughs> Into the nephron loop. Yep. Into DCT. Yep. Into Uh, collecting duct. Yep. yep. And here's where you have to make the connection between the anatomy of a kidney to this. So from the collecting duct, where does it go to next? This one's kind of hard. I'm going to bring you back to this image. Just so you know that the collecting ducts right here are part of what is this right here? Renal pyramid? Yes. So it's moving through, the collecting ducts move through the renal pyramids and right at the end of the renal pyramids, what do you find? Renal pelvis? 
Uh, not yet. Minor calyx? Yes. You got it. To the? Renal pelvis? Not yet. Major calyx? Yes. To the, now you can say it. Renal pelvis, yay. Yep. And then to the? What happens after the renal pelvis? Is it the ureter? Yeah, it is. From the ureter, it goes into the ureters, plural. Urinary bladder. Yep. From the urinary bladder into the urethra. Yeah. And hopefully into a toilet. That's the flow of your information. Okay, we couldn't have gotten there until we went through all the steps, all the parts of the nephron, all the parts of the blood vessel. And then of course, the urinary system overall. Do you see that though? It, you know, if you were to follow the formation of urine, this is the path it would take. For things that aren't excreted through urine, it would be reabsorbed and then you'd go back into the blood vessel pathway. So if it wasn't excreted at this point right here, at the PCT, so if it was not excreted, if it was reabsorbed, it would go anywhere from the PCT to the DCT to the CT almost. It would be reabsorbed into paratubular capillaries. And then from there, it would go to the venule, to the renal vein and back to the body for things that are reabsorbed. Make sense? And then for things that are excreted last minute, it will go through that way. It'll go from the paratubular capillaries into the renal tubules and then continue onward through the urine formation process. That's the big picture. Okay, questions? Ooh, I took up a lot more time for this than I thought I would. Okay. All right, let's go through mictration then. Let's use, I'm gonna put a slide in here. New slide, okay. Let's talk about mictration. Okay. It's interesting because it kind of looks like a uterus, but it formed, you have the urinary bladder that has the, the trigons. Okay, so these are the ureter openings. Then the urethra. Now along the urethra, there are two valves. One, two, there's the internal, and external. Now the lining of the urinary bladder itself has a muscle. Does anyone know what the name of the muscle is called? The dresser. Yep. Now you can get really specific, but we don't in the in the lecture. So we're not gonna make you know the specific like 
it goes through pathway one, two, three, so on. So just know in general what happens. So the detrusor muscle, what happens is when the urinary bladder is full, so when the detrusor muscle is full, there are stretch receptors in here. That senses when it's full. Um, yes, I will try to email it out. Um, I don't know if it's to, today because I still have the night session, so I, I'm going to combine them. So probably tomorrow, later tomorrow for sure. So the stretch receptors will sense that, send the signal to the brain. And then the brain will send a signal to the internal. Okay, and these signals, are they gonna be sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. Yeah. Right. Okay, send a signal to your, your internal urethra valve to do what? To contract or relax? Contract. Mm -hmm. To relax. relax. Exactly. Okay. So this is under involuntary control, where your external one is under voluntary control and it is normally contracted until you're ready to release and relax it. Okay. So it's going to tell your internal to relax. And then when you're ready to release it, your you can control the external valve and release that as you contract the detrusor muscles to kind of squeeze it out. And that's pretty much it for micturation. We don't have you know, you know, beyond that. So whatever you are required to know in the lecture, that's what you will be, um, the question will be based on. And it's pretty straightforward in terms of knowing that it's the detrusor muscle um, has stress receptors, sends it to the brain, and then what, kind of pathway it takes, parasympathetic or sympathetic, and then of the two valves, which one relaxes, which one contracts, and during when. Okay, questions? Okay, so I am running out of time. So I will continue. So let me, let me ask you what you would rather do. So normally I do the questions, the quiz questions. Um, so I can either save the quiz questions until tonight and then do the female reproductive or do the quiz questions for this portion, the urinary portion, and then um, save the female for tonight. So would you like to do the female reproductive lecture? or review, or would you prefer to do the quiz questions for the urinary? Quiz questions. Quiz please. questions. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna stop. Sure. And the review for both will be um, will be recorded, so. So this morning, we just we just kind of start out with the final exam review over overview. So just kind of the, the logistics. The lecture has 100 questions, 50s on the old materials, and it's all multiple choice. That it, that's an MC in her UC. Multiple. That's all multiple choice, um, which means that from the very first chapter to the end, it's divided evenly. So it's not like a lot of questions are focused on one chapter. It's divided evenly amongst the number of chapters, which means there's about two to three questions per chapter. And then the other fifty is all on the new material. So urinary endocrine male and female will compose of 50 questions so that means about 12 to 13 questions per chapter so of that what do you think it's going to will consist of more detailed questions the old stuff or the new stuff new stuff that's right so if i were a student taking this exam i would actually focus on the new stuff more heavily 
and just kind of review the old stuff as I went by, like do a few chapters at a time, just kind of going through it. Since I only have two to three questions on the old stuff, it's not going to be anything super detailed because I already, you know, I already gave you those questions on the exam one, two, and three. So the majority of the questions in the old material are going to be more general, big picture questions. Okay. Um, but still make sure you do review every chapter that we covered through, but not like the way that you did for the exams, for their specific exams. Okay. Can you the give us an example of one of those questions? Um, I'm just having a hard time figuring out what is like the important parts of it since it all seems so important. <laughs> yeah. So do you remember, let's say the muscular system you had to memorize, um, you had to understand, um, let's say you had to understand the sliding filament theory step by step for example, okay? So you will see more generic questions on those rather than the detailed questions that you saw in your exams. Okay. Okay. Um, more general questions could be, what are the functions of the muscular system? Okay. Or what are the main overall things about, you know, the sliding filament theory instead of which one uses, a which step used ATP, which one was pass passive, active, you know? So not that detailed if that makes sense, okay? So it's more, it's much more general questions, okay? Um, a good way to study for the old materials would just be to go through your quizzes, your previous quizzes, your previous exams, okay? And that will kind of get you on track again to kind of remember those things. And you'll find that in anatomy and physiology, what I particularly love about this class is that all the materials build on top of each other so unbeknownstly, you know, you're, you're, you're learning it as you learn the, old, the new stuff because you're building on top of your previous knowledge, okay? Um, so that's for the old material. The new material is gonna be very detailed. Just remember how detailed exam one, two, and three were on their specific chapters. That's how the, the 50 questions for the new materials will be, okay? So the 50 questions of the new materials, 40 will be multiple choice and 10 will be fill in the blank. So very similar to um, your exam one, two, three. Any questions on the lecture exam before I move on? Well, um, oh, sorry. I just had a question on, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. um, are we able to access our old quizzes? Absolutely, you've been able to this whole time. <laughs> Well, don't they like only last for like a certain amount of time and then you can't see the answers anymore, correct? No, no, that's only the correct answers. So you can always see how you oh. do quizzes all the time. But the correct, it, you know, the ones that you get wrong, it shows the correct answer. That yeah. goes away. Okay, sorry, I'll mute. It's, no worries, no, I don't care about that. That's fine. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, that's, okay. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I don't know why I thought they were like only available for a certain amount of time. So I just thought that helps. Thanks. Yeah. There was another you question. Yeah. Do you access the old quizzes through um, the lockdown responders to see um, just how you did on them? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yep. You still have to use respondents lockdown. Um, but you you have always been able to see your exams and your quizzes, just not the correct answers. Yep. Other questions? Okay. Then for the lab, you'll have 50 questions. They'll be fill in the blank and spell and count. So essentially the same as your lab exam one through three. Um, about 25 questions are going to be on the old materials. And again, it's going to be divided evenly amongst the, the chapters. Um, and then 25 questions will be on the new materials. Questions on those? Was it the same thing as the lecture where the old material will be part of the quizzes that we have in exams? The images, you mean? Yes. Yeah, it's the same images. It's just, I don't, it's randomized. So I don't know whether you'll get new ones or you'll get old ones that you've seen in the quizzes and on the previous exams. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But for the lab that you definitely, 
it's to your advantage to look at the quizzes and the exams because mm -hmm. you never know it might be the exact same image that goes up because there it comes all from the same pool your your final exam does not so you will you you shouldn't see the exact same questions that you saw on the quizzes or on the exams on your final exam it comes from a, a separate pool but it's on the same topic but your lab will come from the same picture pool. Okay, other questions? Okay, so for both, it's it's required to have respondents locked down. Um, it's kind of, it's, I. I've been finding that it's been changing the requirements. Like I don't require a picture ID or any of that, but it seems to be requiring that. So just do whatever the settings um, require you to do. There should not be any password requirements, um, but if they change that unbeknownst to me as well, then the password is always anatomy, okay? It's really, really important. I can't stress this enough to make sure that you do your, make sure that the webcam is is properly working as well as your audio um, and to do a proper environmental scan. That environmental scan is, you know, I don't even watch them until, unless Respondents Lockdown flags you and that, that environmental scan is what will protect you um, from any, you know, worries of academic dishonesty. And that's why you do them, not so that I can like see everything, but so that it protects you if I have to look at them. So with your environmental scan, I did give an example in one of the emails about what a proper exam looks like. I'm sorry, not a proper exam, what a proper environmental scan looks like. Um, just to show that there's, you know, there, to scan your whole room, make sure where you're taking the exam is fully covered to your right, to your left, in front of you, behind you. Um, if you're worried about it, just put a mirror behind you so that the webcam will record like, you know, the back of you and, show whether you're using any materials or not you know so the environmental scan is really important because this is not an exam you want to get a zero on be just because you know it flagged you and i don't have any proof that you weren't academically dishonest because if that's the case i have to send it to my program director and then a whole committee views everything to make sure and makes decisions whether there was academic integrity disintegrity or not okay questions about that do we need to use a mirror? Because I take my exams in a study room in the library um, and there's no mirror. You don't have to use a mirror if you can do a full 360. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because some people, their webcam is attached to their desktop computer and it's hard for them to do a 360 without like physically moving their whole computer. Um, oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. in which case then that a mirror would be really useful. I have a question on that. Yes, ma'am. I had a, um, when I take my quizzes, I'm like frozen because I'm scared that it'll go off on me. But I had a quiz that notified me and I was like literally sitting straight frozen looking at the, the camera and everything and it just kicked me out. But it was like just telling me to keep, I guess, my face within, I don't know. But in that case, I think I notified you about it. Mm-hmm. But in that case, I, I, I want to say that was more of like a camera glitch or something because I'm like, I was really sitting in front of the computer. I couldn't move because I get scared that it will go off. Yeah, I, I don't, to be honest, as long as you did the environmental scan on the, I, I never look at them on the quizzes. That's just for you to get used to how it works. Um, oh. And then on the exams, I only look at them if it's flagged. And if it's mm -hmm. flagged, I check the environmental scan. And as long as it shows there's nothing around you, and I have no doubt, even if your eyes shift, if you move out of the camera, for if I only see your forehead and not your full face, I don't really care. It's the only thing I really look at is the environmental scan. But that's how we know that you'll be tired. If it goes off on us, it'll tire. Yep. Like if, if we see something like that, then that's definitely letting you know. Yeah, that flags me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, like if your eye shifts to the right too much or your head you know, to the right or left or your head. It, it's a, it's, it's a proctoring program for sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
but again, I don't even bother watching the videos if you have a really thorough environmental scan. I think it was one of like the first quizzes that I took. Yep. But after that, I didn't do that anymore. Yeah, see, and you use it on the quiz, so it's a safe place to do it on, because I you know, and now you know. <laughs> I swear I freeze. <laughs> don't move too much. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that because I'm like that too. I'm like, I'm afraid to move and stuff when I'm on the exam or like talk out loud to myself. You can talk, yeah, talk to yourself, write on a piece of paper, you know, do whatever you're comfortable doing. And again, I just need to know, you know, show that if someone asks us, okay, this person was flagged, why didn't you, you know, bring it to our attention? I'm like, well, look at their environmental scan. There's nothing around them. So I just figured, you know, that they were fine. All right, so any other questions before I move on? I know it's really nerve wracking already to be on top of everything, but you know, hopefully you've done two, you have done several of them, so you're used to them. And, and as you saw in the emails from the program director, it's, you know, it's gonna be used widely now in all of the classes, so, okay. Um, I have so, one more question. Yeah, 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 please. All right, um, is there a copy of this PowerPoint somewhere? I will email it out with the video recordings. Okay. Yeah. Is there a way to get a blank one so we can follow along? Oh, there isn't, but I can do that. Let, let's see. Um, do you want it now or can, yeah, you want to follow along now, right? Yeah. Okay. If, um, if it will help anybody else, then do it. But if it's just me, then that's fine. Okay. I, I would have to stop the recording and everything so I can go and copy it into a file that is then. Mm, okay, it's okay. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, if it's too small, let me know. I can, uh, you know, widen it a little bit, okay? So, but that's a good thing for me to know for the next class. All right, so for the final exam review, um, it will include the urinary, endocrine, male and female reproductive. So we kind of, we went through the urinary system, um, the list, kind of the objectives. And then we went through the general gross anatomy. We spent a lot of time, right? <laughs> On the nephron, the blood vessels, and then we talked about um, your information. It's a lot of stuff to do all at once. So I would not recommend you starting it all at once. First, just go through the parts of the nephron, then go through the parts of the blood vessel and then how they work together to allow for your information in the following steps, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion, okay? Um, and then, let's see, we kind of skipped over endocrine because no one really requested that one, but I'll save that if we have time at the end. Um, and then now we're gonna move into the female reproductive system, just to make sure I have enough time for everything. So in the female reproductive system, make sure you understand the following terms, gametes. What are gametes? Sperm or eggs. Mm -hmm. But what are they in general? Uh, sex cells. Cells. The sex cells. Yeah, and what, is, what are some characteristics of gametes? Uh, they use meiosis. Okay, so they um, they are a result of meiosis. Okay, what else? They only have half the uh, their sex chromosomes, so they only have half the chromosomes. So twenty three yes. instead of forty six. Yes. Yep. So twenty three chromosomes total, or what's another way of saying that? Haploid. Haploid, very good. So those are some terms you should associate with gametes, that they're haploid, they result after meiosis, um, and that they have 23 chromosomes total, okay? What's fertilization? An egg and a sperm. <laughs> that doesn't tell me much, an egg and a sperm. I mean, when they, when they combine um, together. The egg. Oh, okay, so a little bit um, more. When a sperm and an egg come together, and sperm for penetrates that. the egg. Create when <laughs> when they fuse to create a zygote, so that instantly it's going to be uh, fertilized, hopefully to attach the uterine wall. Okay, so I heard um, 
become a zygote. Okay, so how does it become a zygote? When a sperm penetrates an egg. Okay, and? Get the uh, meiosis two, right? No. It completes oh, meiosis. meiosis two. And what else? Their chromosomes uh, blend together. That's what I'm looking for. That's exactly it. So fertilization is when you have the penetration of the sperm, which allows for the completion of the egg to undergo meiosis two. And then there's a combination of the chromosomes from the sperm and egg. And that's what results in a zygote. Okay, excellent. Can you say that one more time? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so fertilization refers to the sperm penetrating the egg. And that results in the egg completing meiosis two. Then the chromosomes of the egg and the sperm combined becomes one cell that has 46 chromosomes called a zygote. Okay. Yep. So now we know what a zygote is, right? It's the combination, um, it's the result of fertilization, combination of the sperm and egg chromosomes to become one cell. Chromosomes. Okay. What is what are chromosomes? DNA. Yeah, perfect. They're DNA. Okay. So in a human cell, okay, all the chromosomes except for gametes, I'm sorry, all the cells except for gametes have what number of chromosomes? 46. Total or pairs. No. 23 pairs. Pairs. Which, yep, which means there's chromosome one, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome two, chromosome three, three, four, four. So they're identical from chromosome one to 22. And because they're identical, we call them autosomes. The 23rd pair may or may not be identical because it's gonna be X and X or X and Y, which means those are referred to as sex chromosomes. Questions? Okay, cell division, um, two forms, mitosis and meiosis. Can someone help me distinguish uh, the differences between mitosis and meiosis? Mitosis is when the somatic cells divide and meiosis is when the gametes divide. Okay, what else? Mitosis is before birth? Hmm? Mitosis? It does be occur before birth, but it also occurs after birth. So it occurs, it occurs all the time. So it's what is distinctive of mitosis? It's a copy and divide. Wow. So it's, it's like creating the same cell. Beautiful. Correct? Yes. Mitosis, Where the other one's like a reduction. Yes. Mitosis results in identical cells. Meiosis is a reduction. So a reduction of what? Yeah. Reduction of reduction, chromosomes? Yes, it's a reduction of chromosomes. However, it does, however, produce what? So mitosis results in how many new cells? Oh, I did not understand that. I'm sorry. <laughs> mitosis goes from one to two. Uh huh. Meiosis goes from uh, two to nine. Two to nine. From a diploid to haploid. Or two different yeah, ways. But from one to what? Two. two. Four. Four. Very good. Unless you're talking about oogenesis, where there's a mm -hmm. aphasia that happens to the polar bodies. Okay. But it does result in one to four. Meiosis one to two. I'm sorry, mitosis one to two, meiosis one to four. 
Okay, good. Then you should be able to describe the functions of the female reproductive system, describe the female organs, including the ovary, uterine tube, uterus, vagina, and other external female organs, understand oogenesis, um, follicular genesis, and then be able to describe the cycles, ovarian and menstrual. And then in each of the cycles, they have separate phases that you'll also need to know as well as keep track of the hormones. See, it's really difficult. Males are very straightforward, you know, just the spermatogenesis and spermogenesis and then the females, lots to keep track of. So that's why we're gonna spend the majority of this session on the female reproductive system and whatever time we have left, I'll leave it up to you to decide what you'd like me to cover, okay? So general anatomy, I'm gonna number them and you're gonna tell me what they are. Let me take out my pen. Okay, here? Ovary. 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 Yep. Overall? Uterine tube. Uterine, uterine tube. or fallopian tube. Good. And which one's the preferred term? Uterine tube. Yeah. Dr. Fallopian discovered this, and we're trying to move away from um, names. 2A would be what? Embryo. 2B? Oh, would it be the ovarian? No, that's the same. Uh, ovarian ligament? Nope. No, because it's on the tube. It's still the tube, yep. It should be a little bulky like this. It should swell up a little bit right here. The ampulla? Mm. Do you remember that? Mm -mm. <laughs> no. I have read about it, but not on. 2C? The isthmus. The isthmus. The isthmus. Yeah, you got it. Yep. Okay. How about this one? Wait, what was that one called? Isthmus. isthmus. Uterus. Uterus. Okay. And then we're going to do area first, and then we're going to do lining. Okay. So let's do structurally um, area first. So what would this area be right here? Fundus. Fundus. Yeah. Good. And this area? Body. Body. And this area? Oops, sorry. Um, this cervix. area? The cervix? Yep. Let me, let me see right there. Okay. All right. And then let's do lining. Um, you have this lining right here. Perimetrium. Yep. Parametrium, and then this lining right here. Myometrium. Myometrium, and then you have this lining right here. Endometrium. And then this right here. Vagina. Yeah, very good. I'm sorry. Okay. I have a quick question, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. And this is on the quiz that okay. we just had. Mm -hmm. There was a picture on the lab that pointed to what I want to say was the myometrium, but that was not on a part of the lab. Uh, mm, then it shouldn't be. Let's meet afterwards and I'll pull okay. up the quiz. Okay. okay. Yep. If it's not on the list of the, on the PDF, then it's not. Okay. It's not it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So make sure to stay back and ask me. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're going to go right into oogenesis or oogenesis, whatever way you want to pronounce it. And it refers to the development of the ova. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is different from the, some, one of the differences from female versus male is that this happens before the birth of the female. So this happens during a female's fetal development where spermatogenesis occurs at the male's puberty, okay? Oogenesis, even before the female is ever born and during her fetal development, she will go through this process, okay? So this is fetal development, okay? She's gonna have these cells, these stem cells called the oogonia, okay? And the oogonia is going to undergo mitosis. Okay. And that's what is shown right here. OK. 
Okay, it's a little incorrect, so I'm going to fix it a little bit. So here's an oogonia. Is this a haploid or a diploid? Um, what is diploid. it? Diploid. Diploid. How do you know it's diploid? 2N. Two 2N. Two it's 2N. Very good. Okay. So at this point, is this a gamete? No. No. Okay. So this is a regular cell called an oogonia. It is a stem cell because it's going, it, when we say it's a stem cell, that means it's highly what? Highly mitotic, okay? That's why it's gonna undergo my, mitosis quite often. So the oogonia is going to copy. This is the process where it copies. And when it copies, it goes from 2N temporarily to what? 4N. 4N. And then it's going to divide. That's mitosis. Identical copies. Copy and then divide. Okay. One of those two cells will become the primary oocyte. In other words, it differentiates. Remember that term we talked about earlier in the, in the different chapters? Differentiate meaning it's going to become a specific cell. Okay. So the oogonia is going to copy and divide and result in two new identical cells. One of those cells is going to differentiate and become a primary oocyte. The other one stays has an oogonia and repeats this process and continuously undergoes mitosis. Okay, so that you make tons of primary oocytes. Make sense? Doesn't make sense? Questions? Yes, it makes sense. Makes sense. Awesome. Okay, so it differentiates into, into a primary oocyte. And this primary oocyte, still during the fetal development, is going to start meiosis one. Okay, so the first meiosis or meiosis one. Now in meiosis one, it's a divide. Because remember, one of your classmates said it's a reduction. It's a reduction of chromosomes, right? So it's just gonna split. That primary oocyte is gonna split one end on this side, one on end on this side. Do you see that? <laughs> okay. So the result of the first meiosis is gonna result in two cells. At this point, these two cells, are they diploid or haploid? Haploid. Very haploid. good. And now you can call them what? Gametes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, in the female reproductive system, it's more about quality than quantity. Okay, so it's more about quality than quantity. So this process really is just a reduction of the chromosome. So she's only going to keep one of them. The other one is called a polar body. And this polar body right here undergoes atresia. What's atresia? Disintegrates or dies off. Yeah. Disintegrates. Disintegrates. Okay, so dies off. So we're not even going to look at that anymore after this point. Okay. This one that remains is the secondary oocyte. The one that remains is called a secondary oocyte. So if I were to ask you in a test, and I do, <laughs> the result of my of meiosis one results in how many cells? What would you say? One, two. Oh, it's a tricky question, right? right? So if I were to be more specific and say the result of meiosis one on the primary oocyte results in how many secondary oocytes? What would you say? Just one. One. Just one. Because the other one is the polar body. Okay? So we actually won't even consider these because that never happens. Okay? But that would normally happen if that second cell did not die off. Like it does in, like, like it really does in the spermatogenesis. Okay? But in females, 
only one. So that polar body disappears. So that's it for the first meiosis, okay? But here's the thing, this process doesn't even complete because right here, doo -doo, right here, as it's undergoing meiosis one, it just stops. It doesn't even complete. Why? Because you need, because you need sperm hormones to mm -hmm. make it. Yes and no. Because at that point, the female is being born. So at oh. birth, this process just stops. So at birth, oops, wrong color. There we go. Before birth even, so like right when she's about to be born, this whole process stops, arrested development. So it doesn't even finish. Does not finish what? Meiosis one. There you go. Doesn't even finish meiosis one and she's born and it stops. And it only continues when? Puberty. Yeah, why? Hormones. Yes. And that's why there's a saying, right? A female is born with all the eggs she will have in her lifetime. That is true. Okay. Because this mitosis right here that happens will develop all of the primary oocyte that she will have, that she will need in her lifetime. And now is at puberty, she's just gonna, you know, pick 20, throw them into, <laughs> you know, throw them into being developed to develop. And then of those 20, the one that's the fastest, the best is what is released each month. Okay, questions? So at puberty, lots of things happening, but mostly we're talking about hormones. What hormone are we talking about? FSH. Yep, that's it. The main one is FSH. FSH is gonna stimulate the development and completion of meiosis one. So FSH is going to help you know, go through this process uh, and it's very elaborate process. So we we have to spend some time separately on that, okay? Because it's, it's very complex. But essentially this whole thing right here, okay, is very complex. It involves follicular genesis and a lot of other steps. So we're just gonna leave it for now and know that at puberty, FSH stimulates this process so that the egg completes meiosis one, okay, and results in a secondary oocyte right here. So this is what is completed each month. And that is what is released each month. So one, usually, not all the time, one secondary oocyte is released each month, okay? So that is what the secondary oocyte is released from the ovary each month. During what process? Meiosis. Hmm? Oh. Ovulation? Yes. Oh, yeah. During ovulation. And ovulation, of course, is controlled by another hormone, LH. Okay. Now, once the secondary oocyte is released from the ovary, it's going to be swept in by what? The what? Swept in by the fimbri. Yes, exactly. Sometimes it doesn't. It's not connected. So sometimes you can have what's called an atopic pregnancy, mm -hmm. where the sperm is all, makes its way all the way up out of the uterine tube. And if the egg is kind of like swimming around it can fertilize there, but of course it, there's no uterine lining to support the growth. So it doesn't, usually it does not come to full term. 
Okay. All right. So the secondary oocyte is what is ovulate. It was ovulate or released from the ovary. And it has a couple of different possibilities. Okay. Two. Now, if fertilization does not occur, that secondary oocyte is nothing happens to it and it's released through menstruation. So if fertilization doesn't occur, it's that secondary oocyte just breaks down, is released through menstruation. If fertilization does occur, so if fertilization does occur, then this next step happens. Okay. Only if what occurs? Fertilization. Yeah. So, do, 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 do. <laughs> there you go. If the sperm penetrates the egg, it's going to cause that egg to complete meiosis. In other words, it's going to undergo meiosis what? Two. Yes. And where meiosis one is a divide, meiosis two is going to be a copy and divide. Okay, so here's the secondary oocyte. Is going to copy and become what? Diploid. Yep. And then it's going to divide. And go back to being. Haploid. Mm -hmm. Two haploids. Is, Two haploids, very good. This is the ovum and this is another polar body. What happens to the polar body? Atresia. Atresia. So now that it's completed meiosis one and meiosis two, now it can do what? What did I draw? A zygote? This, yeah. yeah. So here's the sperm's end. Here's the ovum's end. Now, once it's completed meiosis two, it can combine and become two N. And you're right, that results in a zygote. I'm gonna do it like this and like this, and like this, and like this, just to show the difference. Does that make sense? What are you doing in red? What is the female? Yes. The male, the male chromosome, the half that is contributed by the, by the sperm. So now this zygote is 2N, Oh, I didn't mean to make it red. Half from the sperm, half from the ovum. Is this zygote a gamete any longer? No. No, it's not. Because now it is a diploid. Does this make sense? Questions? Um, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take kind of. I think if I spend more time with it, I'll be able to make it make sense. Yep. And it makes sense when I have everything in front of me. The moment you take it away, I'm like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That always happens. <laughs> That's why you should quiz yourself a few days after you study the materials. Okay. I wrote it down like 10,000 times. <laughs> yeah, that helps too. Yep. Okay. Is everyone okay with oogenesis before we move on to follicular genesis? Yes. yes. 
Okay. So on the left side, you can see oogenesis, which is what we we just finished. Okay. Check to see if you can explain this image now. So mitosis copies, and here it's showing how it actually is another cell here, and then just repeating itself. Meiosis one starts but stops until adolescent. And then meiosis one will finish, which results in a secondary oocyte and a polar body. Then the secondary oocyte is what is ovulated. If not fertilized, it just dies. If it's fertilized, it combines the chromosome. I'm sorry, first it penetrates the secondary oocyte complete meiosis two, resulting in a polar body right here. Then the one that remains the ovum, this genetic information combines and results in an, a zygote. The zygote becomes an embryo, embryo becomes a fetus, and so on. Okay, questions? All right, so hopefully we have that firm, you know, a little bit more firm. Then we're gonna now follow the follicle. Okay, so the follicle also is follows through this timeline. The follicle is what surrounds the egg or the ovum. Okay, so these are cells that surround the ovum. Okay. So while it's still in oogonia, it's going to be surrounded by what's called the primordial follicle. Primordial follicle. Okay. The primordial follicle are it's a structure, right? Made up of these cells. These cells are specifically at this point called follicular cells. Okay. In terms of tissue, they, the primordial follicle is made up of simple squamous epithelium. Okay, so the tissue, remember tissue comes, it, tissues are made up of a bunch of cells. So the primordial follicle, that structure is made up of this tissue, simple squamous epithelium. And the cells that make up the simple squamous epithelium are referred to as follicular cells. Okay, during fetal development, the primordial follicle does not change at all. Where the ovum changes, undergoes mitosis, nothing happens to the primordial follicle. Okay, at birth, same thing happens. It undergoes arrest and it continues again at adolescent. And it's the follicle that particularly is influenced by what? Yes. That's why it's called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. So really between the ovum and the follicle in this process, it's really the follicle that's changing the majority at this point. Okay, so the follicle is going to be stimulated by the, fo um, the follicle stimulating hormone. It's gonna cause the primordial follicle to become a primary follicle. Okay, so the primordial follicle at puberty, each month, the follicle stimulating hormone is going to trigger about 20 to 25 primordial follicles to become a primary follicle. So FSH stimulates about 20 to 25 primary follicles to develop into a, prim I'm sorry, prim primordial follicle to develop into a primary follicle which means there's also 20 to 25 what that's also moving along. Polar bodies? Nope, not polar bodies. Eggs? Yeah, the ovum, the egg. Mm -hmm. Okay, because remember the follicles surround the egg. So if the follicles yeah. are moving along, so is the egg. So there's 20 to 25 of the primordial follicle slash secondary oocyte that goes through this process. Okay. 
Okay. So the FSH is going to stimulate those 20 to 25 to go from a primordial follicle to a primary follicle. What's the difference? Just look at the image. What's the difference? The cells around. Exactly. The tissue transitions from the simple squamous epithelium to simple cube, oops, to simple cuboidal. epithelium. Okay. At this point, they're still called follicular cells. It's still simple though. It's one layer of cube-like shaped cells, but it does, it did change. Okay. And it gradually changes from the follicular cells to becoming the granulosa cells. Okay. And it's going to continue, the FSH is going to continue driving this change then from the prim primary follicle to a secondary follicle. And what do you notice the difference in the, uh, in the tissue? There's more layers. There's more layers, exactly. So it becomes stratified. columnar, I'm sorry, cuboidal, not columnar, cuboidal epithelium consisting of granulosa cells. Because at this point, they're all granulated, granulosa cells. Okay. And that's what this is. So the primary follicle is going to develop into the secondary follicle. And how are they different? It's stratified cuboidal epithelium. There are a couple other things that I included, but I don't think you need to know them on your, I don't think they're included in the lecture. Do you remember um, Thelica follicle and Zona pellucida? No, no, yeah. oh, those were not there. Okay, I tend to be a little bit more detailed in my face-to-face -face lecture. So whatever is in your lectures, that's what you need to know, okay? So if I have something here that's not in your lecture, don't be like, oh, do we have to know that? No, you don't, okay? We only quiz you what is on your lecture. I just like to provide a little bit more, okay? All right, so then the, the secondary follicle is gonna to continue to develop and become the tertiary follicle. And look, huge difference, right? What's the difference? The antrum. The antrum, exactly, which is why I think that your lecture should have included the zona pellucida because the zona pellucida is what enlarges and becomes the antrum, but whatever, antrum. So that's distinctive of the tertiary follicles that it develops this antrum. What's important about the antrum? It contains a glycoprotein gel that helps you kind of nourish, um, nourish that, that um, ovum, okay? All right. And then the tertiary follicle of the 20 to 25, only one, one becomes a mature. Mature follicle. And that's the one that will be ovulated. Okay, so here's the thing. That mature follicle right there, when it becomes a mature follicle, it's actually going to start the release of estrogen. And when you have the release of estrogen, that's gonna result in the decrease of, S of FSH. Why is that significant? Because... FSH makes, stimulates the follicles. So you want that to stop? Yes. So remember we said 20, it's a race. 20 to 25 go through this process. When one reaches the completion, in other words, it's kind of like the best, it causes all the others to die. 
by, by starving it of FSH. No FSH, no continued development. Because here we already have one that reached that final development stage. Okay, so truly females are about quality over quantity. This would never happen to males because males is about quantity. They want as much as possible so that it can have the highest chance of fertilization. But females, because that egg will become the new, you know, the cell that will continue on to become the zygote, to become the embryo and so on, it's got to be the best each month. Questions? So as FSH decreases, guess what increases? LH. That's right. Because now it knows that one has reached that final line, final maturation, it's going to start to release LH. And LH is going to cause what? Ovulation. Yeah, look at that timing. Right, so it's like it, this tells this that it has happened, this tells that that it has happened, and so on. Was I not so supposed to watch that video? <laughs> what video? The one in the email for this lecture. You could. It's it's the same thing that I'm talking about now. Yeah, I watched it like ten times. <laughs> That's why I feel bad. good. <laughs> it helps, though. It really does help watching the videos. Okay, so there's a decrease in FSH, but an increase in LH because why? It's ready. It's ready to be popped out. <laughs> it's the best one. So it's ready to be, you know, released. And that's why ovulation occurs. So then the secondary oocyte right here. Oh, I shouldn't have said, that. I should have asked you. What's, what cell is released? <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> secondary oocyte is released. True or false? It has completed meiosis. False. Yeah, thank you. I love that. It can't, it doesn't complete meiosis until what happens? Fertilization. That's right. That's right. Yep. Okay. So A meiosis too, correct? That's right. Okay. Yep. Yep. But when I say meiosis in general, I include meiosis one and two. Okay, so the secondary oocyte has only finished meiosis one, but not two, so it hasn't completed the whole meiosis process, okay? Then the follicle right here, the mature follicle, stays behind in the ovary. Let's do this. The mature follicle stays behind in the ovary and becomes the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum also has a role because now that the egg has been released, the, the female body has to do what in preparation? Thickens. Yes, what thickens? The wall. The uterine wall? The uterine wall, exactly. And the hormone that will do that is called Just progesterone. So the corpus luteum is going to produce progesterone. And progesterone is what leads to the thickening of what layer of the uterine wall? And, and Endometrium. No. endometrium, beautiful. And what of the endometrium, what specific layer of the endometrium does it affect? Does it build? What layer does it build? The stratum functionalis. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm running out of room, so I'm just going to put stratum F, SF, okay? That's stratum functionalis. Okay, that's mm -hmm. it. But you have to admit it's pretty dang cool how everything is coordinated like this. It's like it's just not a random event. You know, this triggers this, this triggers that. I don't know. I think that's pretty awesome. Questions?
How about I ask you questions? What hormone triggers ovulation? LH. What hormone triggers the follicles to develop? FSH. What hormone triggers LH to be released? Estrogen. I heard it. Estrogen. Yes. Okay. How many primordial follicles slash ovum are stimulated each month? 20 to 25. How many is released? One. Yeah. Okay. Good. You got it. No questions? We're going to move on then. Okay. Whew, this is a crazy one, right? So now we're going to, so you notice that we did it in, in, in like chunks. I would never do this all together like you, you're seeing on this picture right here. I would first do it as oogenesis, just to understand that first, and then follicular genesis, and then the uterine lining, and then everything together. Okay, because if you do it all together at once, it just is too crazy. Okay, so now we're gonna focus on this bottom one right here, the uterine cycle. Okay, so you can see that the uterine cycle goes through changes in preparation um, for what happens in the to the ovum, okay? So when we start with the FSH, it's really what's happening to the, to the uterus is that it's just finishing off the last cycle. So that's why it starts with the menstrual phase because it's just finishing it off. And as it's finishing off, there's not really much happening here in terms of you know hormonal changes. We just know that progesterone's gone. Um, it's starting to reset itself. And as, it's re as the uterus is resetting itself, that's where you have the follicles developing from the primordial follicle to the primary follicle to the secondary to the tertiary slash mature, okay? And you can see that FSH drives the, move, the change of the follicle, but it's really estrogen and progesterone that drives the, ch the changes in the uterine lining. So estrogen is going to lead to the proliferative phase. So it's going to start to, to form the stratum functionalis. And progesterone and estrogen is what keeps it thick. It what is what makes it thick. Okay. And that's pretty much it for in terms of the uterine cycle or the, the changes in the uterus. Okay. So kind of to put it all together. You can see there's the follic so in the ovarian cycle, there is just two, three main phases: the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. Where in the uterine cycle, it's divided further into the menstrual phase, pre-ovulatory phase, ovulation post-ablatory, and that's divided even further into the circuitory phase and the luteal and, um, and pre-menstrual phase, okay? So the post-ablatory right here is actually, I don't know if you can see the bottom of the screen. Yeah, you can't, but it, it actually has two also. So a really good um, handout to look at, and this is on the navigational one, is this one that I made. I love this. It took me a long time to make this, so. but it, I, you know, it helped me a lot when I was learning this process as well. So you can see that I divided, so everything in the white is the ovarian cycle. So everything here is the ovarian. Oh, why, why did it do that? Oops. There we go ovarian cycle in the clear area right here and in the shaded area, this would be the menstrual cycle. Oh, 
or it's also referred to as the uterine cycle. Okay. And so you can see I count it for, for fetal development here. And then at puberty. And then you can see that there are the three phases in the ovarian cycle, the follicular phase, and what happens there, the ovulation, and then the luteal phase. Where in the uterine or menstrual cycle, you have the menstrual phase, the proliferative phase, ovulation, secretory phase, and the premenstrual phase. And it follows kind of what happens in each of those steps. Okay. So this is a nice one. What I would recommend you to do is to delete all of this, make it blank and see if you can kind of keep track of it on your own, but you also have a key. Use this as a key to kind of make sure that you're, you're keeping track of all of that. Okay, questions? Um, where was that resource? That's in the navigational. So in each of your module, there's the, the lecture, the lab and the navigational. So it's in the navigational, but you know what? I'll make it easier and I'll just email it um, with um, this PowerPoint, PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hopefully that helps. Do you have any questions on this overall process? Questions, questions, or you need some time to think it through. Always feel free to email me questions if you have them later on, okay? All right, so now what would you like me to cover next? Um, do the male, do the endocrine, or do the urinary? I would say endocrine, um, since we I feel like it was a little more in depth than the male. Okay, let's do endocrine. Okay, so for the endocrine system, make sure you know the functions of the endocrine system, be able to define the hormones and its role and describe um, the glands that play a role in it. So the best thing to do for this one is to make a cognitive map, okay? So the cognitive map should include the name of the hormone and the abbreviation, where it's secreted and at sometimes where it's produced, because sometimes it's different, but most of the time it's the same, okay? What does it target and what is its action, okay? And sometimes it helps to do this. So when I was studying for this, this is what I did. Okay. For me, because I like to see things better. I kind of drew it all out. You can do a cognitive map if you prefer. Or you can do a drawing like this. And then I just list them and then write down what they do there as well, okay? So you can do it that way or you can just have a cognitive um, chart like this that lists all of them. So you can see the anterior pituitary gland produces six hormones, the growth hormone, the follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, prolactin and thyroid stimulating hormone. Now there's a little, um, Note though, that some of these hormones, because they uh, 
cause other hormones to be released, they're referred to as tropic. Okay, so if on a test I ask you which of the following is a tropic hormone, I'm asking for which hormone causes other hormones to be released. And it turns out that the anterior pituitary gland is responsible for three of them. Okay, so let's go through them. So growth hormone, okay, it's gonna be produced where? In the end, produced and secreted by the anterior pituitary gland. What is it target? Various cells, but mainly the bone and muscles. Okay, and what does it do? It stimulates growth. And what do we mean by growth? Growth can either be like this in size, or it could be in numbers. In other words, mitosis. Okay, so that's what growth hormone does. The follicle stimulating hormone, we talked a lot about that, right? Um, we only cover what it does in the female reproductive, but it also plays a role in the male reproductive as well. So it targets both sex organs. And what sex organs are we talking about? The testes. Mm hmm and? Ovaries. Yep. So it's gonna stimulate the maturation of the eggs and sperm. So, oh, but notice right here, I said maturation of the egg, where here I say sperm production. Now that should make sense, right? Because FSH is not stimulating the production of the eggs because that happens in fetal development where it actually just does the maturation of the eggs and more specifically of the follicles, right? Where it actually does cause sperm production. Okay. I have a does question that, on that one. Yep, yep. Um, in my notes, I have that as a tropic hormone. It is a tropic hormone as well. So, okay. Oh, I just, oh, yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. That was, I just, you're right. Sure. Yep. Good point. Okay. Then we have luteinizing hormone. This also targets the sex organs. So the same testes and ovaries. And it leads to ovulation in females and testosterone secretion in males. Okay. Questions? Where's testosterone produced in males? The secular, no. The interstitial cells? That's right. Perfect. Okay. Then you have the adrenocortical tropic hormone, ACTH for short. It targets the adrenal cortex. Okay. Because remember, the adrenal gland has the cortex and the medulla. So it's targeting the cortex. Specifically, it's going to stimulate the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. Okay. And what does cortisol do? Store energy? Mm, no. When I think of it, I just think of like a stress response. Yep. How many of you ever heard of hydrocortisone? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So when do you use hydrocortisone? For pain? Yeah, for pain, inflammation. So pain and inflammation is oftentimes resulting from stress. So your body releases cortisol as kind of a, it suppresses that, okay? So it suppresses the inflammation, it suppresses the, um, the swelling, okay? So oftentimes cortisol is, has the effect of being um, anti-immune. Anti 
So it suppresses your immune system and thus suppresses inflammation. Okay, and you'd only wanna do that during stress responses. Okay. Questions on that? So just remember cortisol, hydrocortisol, okay? Mm -hmm. Then prolactin, pro meaning for, lactin meaning milk, right? So prolactin is going to target the mammary glands and it's going to result in milk production. Prolactin is not to be confused with oxytocin. In oxytocin, in females, it's going to cause the release of milk as well as labor contraction. And it makes sense that those go hand in hand. Okay. So what's the difference between milk production versus release of milk? Well, milk production is how it's made, like what's in it and just the releases, how it gets out yep. to so the infant. Any of you have had a child in, um, so one common experience is that after birth, the breast will just leak milk regardless. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the oxytocin. Okay, questions? Okay, then we have the thyroid stimulating hormone, just like its name, thyroid stimulating hormone. It's going to stimulate the thyroid to produce the thyroid hormones. And the thyroid hormones have what effect? Metabolism. That's right. Okay. So it targets the thyroid gland and it stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete thyroid hormone. Now here's, this one is really cool. So all the way here, it's gonna stimulate what's in your, your thyroid, which is located on either sides of your neck. So here's your trachea, I'm sorry, here's the larynx, here's the trachea and so on. So the thyroid gland is supposed to secrete thyroid hormone. Okay, and thyroid hormone influences metabolism. But in order to produce that, it needs iodine. Okay. So oftentimes what happens is that the thyroid hormone, which influences, so if metabolism is low, the body is going to want to increase thyroid hormone. But if it senses that the thyroid hormone isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's actually going to send a signal to the anterior pituitary gland. And the anterior pituitary gland is going to send a signal to the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is going to continuously increase because the body thinks it's not producing the thyroid hormone, even though it is, but it just lacks the iodine. So it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So what happens? What results? Inflammation of the thyroid. Swelling. Yep. It, the, the thyroid gland enlarges. Okay. And then sometimes you'll see that condition where the thyroid gland is really enlarged and, and someone will have a really bulky neck. Okay, and oftentimes it's also associated with, you know, larger people because that it, it affects their metabolism. Okay, all right. Then in the posterior pituitary gland, it is released by the posterior pituitary gland, but it is produced in the hypothalamus. And there are just two the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone. So the oxytocin we talked about before, in females, it causes the release of milk and it causes labor contractions. So during this, so the baby's head is gonna hit against the cervix of the female and that is gonna cause the release of oxytocin and oxytocin is gonna induce muscle contraction of the of the uterine lining. And this process occurs through what feedback? Positive feedback or negative feedback? Positive. positive. Yeah, exactly. So it's positive feedback. So the oxytocin is gonna cause more labor contractions and then the labor contractions are gonna cause the baby's head to hit more against the cervix, which causes more 
oxytocin to be released, and then that continue, that's like a, a positive feedback loop, okay? In males, it's going to stimulate the propulsion of the semen, ejaculation essentially, okay? Then the antidiuretic hormone, just like its name, anti meaning against, diuretic meaning you lose water. So an antidiuretic hormone would do what? Cause you to urinate more or to urinate less? More because you're releasing more. Less? Less. Yeah. Diuretic, yep, diuretics will cause you to urinate more. Antidiuretic will cause you to urinate less. It allows for water retention. Okay. And you retain the water through reabsorption, which means it's going to target the kidneys. And we just learned that this in the morning. Where in the kidneys is responsible for water reabsorption? The PCT. Not the PCT. Or nephron loop. Collection duct in the nephron. Yeah, nephron loop majority and somewhat in the collection collecting duct. Okay. Kind of cool it makes sense, right? You can connect different chapters to each other. And that's really kind of the big point of this. As you go into your field, it's not about just one body system because one body system has huge effects on all the other body systems. And that's what you need to be cognizant of, okay? Questions? Um, in my notes, I have that the posterior pituitary gland is stimulated by modified axons. Yep, um, from the what hypothalamus. Does that mean? So, so the axons hypo from the hypothalamus? Yes. Yep. So it's called the okay. hypothalamus hypophysial tract. Um, I'm trying to find a place to draw. Okay, so we'll do it here. No, I'm I was also that. confused on this one. <laughs> So here's the hypothalamus. Here's the PPG, APG. So it's like this. That's what it means. So the hypothalamus controls the posterior pituitary gland, okay, through the nervous system, the axons. It sends signals to whether to the posterior pituitary gland to say, okay, I've sent some hormones to you, now release them. Okay, does that make sense? Can you explain like, I I don't know, I got this wrong on the quiz, but like mm -hmm. um, where the hormones are produced, like is the hypothalamus producing all of the hormones and then sending no. them off separately? I'm confused no, on that. Yep. Can you explain? Yep, absolutely. So there's only two that is where it's released is not where it's produced. And it's these two right here. So the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone, it's actually produced in the hypothalamus, but released in the posterior pituitary gland. And thus it's controlled through axons from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary gland. Everywhere else, where it's produced is also where it's secreted. Did I answer your question? Right, so all the APG hormones are produced and released through the APG. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Others? Okay. All right, so you would, so what we did here, you would continue for the other organs as well. So you would continue it for the thyroid gland, um, here, you would continue it for the pancreas. Let's see, so thyroid gland, pancreas, I'm trying to remember, adrenal glands. Okay, so for all the other organs, um, you would identify the hormones. What is it targeting? What is its action? Okay. 
questions? Is there one that you want me to cover more? Um, with the adrenal glands, are we going to need to know like the layers? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Could you do the adrenal gland? Yeah. So the adrenal gland is divided into two main layers. What are the two main layers? The cortex and the medulla. Okay. And those are very common terms, right? We talked about the cortex and medulla in the brain even and, and so on. Okay. So what does the cortex and the medulla refer to? The outer is the cortex. Mm -hmm. So let's go like this. And the middle would be the medulla. Okay, so the cortex is divided into three separate layers. Let's do this. What's the outermost? So let's do um, one, two, three. So what would the outermost layer be? The zona glomerulus. Very good. Glomerulosa. This glomerulus is the, the kidney, okay? How about number two? Actually, I'm going to leave. Uh, I can write it on the side. How about number two? It's hard to say, but the zona fasciculate. Okay. Zona fasciculata. Oops. Oh, let me rewrite that. This. Okay, and then the third one? Uh, zona reticularis. Great. Okay, so then the zona glomerulosa, what is that responsible for? In general, what kind of, what name is that? Uh, is that uh, uh, aldosterone? Yeah, uh, you're right, but in general, what would we call that? It's responsible for releasing mineral corticoids. Um, and well, earlier, someone said it affects mineral balance, salts, electrolytes, electrolytes exactly. And the specific hormone that I had you know, there are others, but the specific one that I had you know is aldosterone. Okay, and aldosterone, what does aldosterone do? What does it target and what does it do? The nephrons? Yes, beautiful. And what does it do? Oh, it's like reabsorbing the salt for. Yep. Keep going. So it um, increases salt reabsorption. And if it increases salt reabsorption, what always follows? So it's retaining the water? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Zona fasciculata, in general, what do we call it? I should give myself more room. Uh, cortisol. 
Yep, but general name. Glucocorticoids. Okay. And that, just like how mineral corticoids affect the salt um, and electrolytes, glucocorticoids affect glucose metabolism. And the specific hormone, there's a few, but the specific hormone that I had you know is cortisol. It could also include cor um, cortisone, cor corticosterone, ster sorry, corticosterone, okay? But the one that I had you know is cortisol. And we talked about that earlier, right? It's, in, it's released in response to stress because in response to stress, you wanna store as much glucose as possible because it knows that if you, you know, if you need a lot of glucose to, to, to energize your body, okay? Questions on that? Sorry, that's my loud cat. Okay, how about the last one, zona reticularis? It's going to be responsible for releasing androgens. Okay, and these often are associated with stimulating masculinity. So testosterone, but it can also do estrogen as well. Stimulate. Masculinization. So influences estrogen, testosterone. Okay. And then how about the medulla? What does the adrenal medulla do? Epinephrine and norepinephrine? Yep, yep. So they're responsible for your stress hormones. And specifically, these stress hormones work in connection to your nervous system because these hormones can also act as neurotransmitters. Nervous system. And specifically, the autonomic nervous system. And what portion of the autonomic nervous system do you think it's going to trigger? The cardiac. Mm, yep. So if so, what what part? So you actually have two pathways that can stimulate the cardiac. You have sympathetic and parasympathetic. Which one do you think these will will stimulate? Sympathetic. Very good. And there are two, like someone said, there's epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay. Questions? Can you repeat um, the process one more time for reticularis? Sorry. Sure. So the zona reticularis is responsible for, re for producing androgens. And androgens usually are, usually are associated with stimulating masculinity, masculinity or masculin, masculinization. So it's oftentimes associated with testosterone, but it can also be associated with estrogen. Okay. So for example, there are certain conditions like, for example, in um, there is androgen um, stimulating inhibitory, inhibitory receptors where in males, okay, their antigen receptors is blocked and that prevents them from having the masculinity um, characteristics. And then what can happen is that they can start to develop breast, you know, female characteristics. So even though they're genetically male, they can look female because of the antigen receptor inhibition. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, usually I give you like disease related so that you can kind of make sense of it. But if that doesn't work, let me know and I'll figure out another way to describe it. Any other questions on the hormones? <laughs> 